Hello, um, thank you very much for joining us for this afternoon's sessions. Uh, I'm Julian Gwinnett, I'm one of uh, three co-chairs of the University's Disabled Staff Network, and I'm joined here today by my fellow colleague, Melanie Best. And today, this afternoon's presentation is around disability um, and suicide prevention, the ebbs and flows. And this is something that I will think will be of particular relevance for people with neurodiverse conditions, including myself here. Um, and Claire is, uh, I'll hand over to Claire because I don't want to steal your thunder. Um, and I'll let you continue with this afternoon's presentation, Claire. Yeah, thank you, Julian. And, and thank you everybody uh, for joining this session. Uh, I'm really quite humbled uh, to be asked uh, to be part of this. Um, I'm the, the university's academic lead uh, for mental health and wellbeing within the new um, directorate of students and education. Um, and I'm also our city's uh, independent chair for um, our suicide prevention stakeholders um, forum. And that what that arguably does is oversees the city's um, action plan in relation to um, suicide prevention uh, intervention and also postvention. And, you know, we will we, we'll possibly talk through some of those principles today in terms of where we're going strategically uh, with suicide prevention. But I wanted to stop really and take stock when we look at this through the lens of, of inclusivity and really question how inclusive current suicide prevention strategies actually are. Um, for anyone who knows me well, um, I'm, I'm not averse to problematizing things, but when we do that, I think that's when we can pull together and, and co-conceive um, solutions. My underpinning philosophy really for suicide prevention is one of a democratized approach. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that I believe that everybody deserves um, and has the right to know how to keep themselves and indeed possibly others safe from um, suicide. We need to be cognizant of the fact that this topic has been around for millennia. Mm -hmm. It's been around as long as, as we have, have existed as a species. Um, and it's gone on a journey, it's gone on, on political journeys, um, relationships with, with um, ontological views around faith, um, law, it, it's just been there. And I think some of those legatorial things can actually eat through into our modern day view of, of suicide prevention as a topic that can be stigmatizing. Um, so if in the course of today's session, you know, I, I say something um, that I'm suggesting maybe isn't helpful um, or has been indicated by survivors of suicide attempts that isn't helpful and you're all sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, I've said that or I've done that, please, I don't want anybody to sit here today thinking, oh, I feel like I'm being told off um, or I've done the wrong thing rarely do we get the time space and place to think about this topic to discuss it um, through fear of saying the wrong thing uh, very often so please please don't sit there and think oh my goodness I'm hoping at least one segment of today you can take away and think oh I didn't know that before and I'm going to go and look at that a little bit more or I didn't know that before and I can make that change within this particular um, environment um, and also do take care. I think if any of you are in a position today where you're thinking that maybe this isn't the right time um, or you've got other things going on, please don't feel like you've got to sit here and tolerate that um, in that sense. If, if you need to take a break, if you need to leave, no one will be chasing your attendance or, or just make sure you keep yourself well. And if any of today's session um, does upset you, and you feel yourself becoming overwhelmed, please remember that you matter um, and that arguably there is support out there. So now I've done my um, pitch, I'm hoping this, this works. I think it, it would be wrong really to start such a session uh, without looking at some of the prevalence of, of suicide um, overall from a global context, but also from a, a UK based context. Um, it's really, really hard, if I'm frank, when we think about statistics, because what I don't want to do is, is brush stroke, generalise, make it sound like I'm chucking stats through the air, the air without recognising that behind every life, you know, statistic is a life lost. It's someone, someone. And I think we need to remember that when we're talking about the statistical prevalence of anything, let alone um, completed suicide tragedies, in, in my view. 
The World Health Organization have long asserted that suicide is a complex issue for which no one single cause exists. I think we need to hold on to that notion as we're going through this session today. There's been an automatic um, connotation that one has to have a diagnosable um, or a, a prominent mental health issue to experience a suicidal thought. And that's not the case. That is not the case. And nor is it necessarily symptomatic of something necessarily being wrong in our life. It can be lots of things happening. So we need to be minded of that. And when I'm also going through these statistics, I want us to remember that for every story of where there's a tragedy, there are far more many of hope, far more many people who have actually survived and overcome that distress and have gone on to live another day and, and turn their lives around. So I want to, you to be minded of that, as I say, as we're going through these statistics. The World Health Organization would argue that just shy of around a million people die by suicide um, each year. And if we equate that and strip that back in terms of, of, of time phase, we, that was arguably every 40 to 60 seconds, somebody is losing their life um, to suicide in a worldwide um, context. More people have died by suicide than all the wars and the homicides combined in our collective history as a species. And again, when you think about that, it's, it's huge, absolutely huge. In a UK context, we've known for a long, long while now that suicide is amongst the commonest cause of death for a man under the age of 49. But an act of self-harm is also one of the commonest causes for a woman to be admitted to a medical ward. So again, we need to look at this on a continuum of, of those who may be attempt suicide and then those who go on to arguably um, complete. One of the things that we should be minded of is that in my position doing the work that I do with, with wonderful colleagues in public health in Wolverhampton is that by the time we get the data from the ONS, it's, it's kind of out of date. It's, it's, it doesn't allow us to do anything in a real time um, perspective um, because we have to base it on a three year aggregated figure based on, on, on the way that the statistics work. So one of the, the problems we've got, one of the snags we've got with statistics at the moment is the fact that they go by the date of verdict, not by the date of death. Now, it can take anywhere from a week to a year or sometimes years for verdicts to actually um, be, be passed. So we need to be minded of that in terms of, of, of statistical prevalence. Another thing to be minded of that you know, suicide has not been a criminal offence in the UK um, from 1961. And many people aren't aware that it ever was. <laughs> it's one of the, the, the myths and misconceptions that actually exist around the topic itself. But it was, up until 1961, uh, a criminal offence in the UK to make an attempt on your own life or, or to take your own life. And you might think, well, how do we ever punish that? Well, we look at some of the policies even to the current day, life insurance payouts, other mannerisms where we will arguably put those barriers um, in place to, to criminalize that particular um, act. Another thing to be minded of also is that whilst it hasn't been a criminal offense since 1961, the bar of law to verdict to suicide was still at that criminal level only until 2018. So it hasn't been that long ago that the bar of law was still at that criminal level to be able to verdict to suicide. Now, if we think about how that might impact on statistics or statistical prevalence, if the bar has been much higher, so the bar of evidence required to verdict suicide has been that high, I think it's safe to say that we might not have an accurate picture of, of how many people are losing their life to suicide because of that particular nuance. And at the other end of the spectrum, arguably, if we have now lowered the bar since 2018, we need to treat with caution any associated escalate, you know, elevation in suicide rates. Is that as a result of more people dying by suicide or because it's easier to verdict it now? Another thing that we think about in terms of statistics is that very rarely do they actually go down to the nuance of intricacies around disability. Um, uh, ethnicity isn't even commonly recorded in some instances indefensibly. 
Now that's really, really important when we think of this from a commissioning point of view for services, because if we have a hunch in our local area that suicide is affecting a particular community, if we have any hope of getting commission support to actually address that, we need proof, we need statistics. We, we need them. So these are really, really hopefully pertinent points that I'm making in terms of a, a problem around the statistical prevalence in, you know, just taking that data as, as fact really, and not looking at the, the, the problems that actually are inherently um, underpinning them. Another thing to be minded of also when we think about um, the prevalence of, of, of suicide prevention uh, strategies um, and the campaigns that are there to arguably um, prevent suicide. We know from an evidence base that we're aware of that there are two things that we can arguably say are most likely to prevent suicide. And they are mitigation of access to means. But the one I really actually want to focus on today and really hone in on is the fact of help seeking. It is more likely if you seek help for your distress, reach out, gain some solution to some of the problems you may well be navigating, that you are more likely to be tipped back to a point of safety. That is what the evidence is actually telling us and I believe in that wholeheartedly. So that's obviously what a lot of public health campaigns do on the, the, the wider whole population system principle is actually look to ways of actually increasing the likelihood that you as an individual who is struggling will actually find it okay to speak up, to just talk, tell someone that that's how you're feeling. Now, there is a, a movement amongst the survivors movement within suicide prevention, and rightly so, thank goodness, who are saying it's all fair and well looking at us as the people who need to come forward when we're struggling. But what about the relational barriers that we navigate when we do? What, what, what about that? Why are we not looking at this from the community um, perspective in terms of whoever we may reach out to? Can you absolutely guarantee that the, the support that we will receive will be one of understanding, one of, of empathy, compassion, and all the other things that we arguably know very often can tip somebody back to a point of safety? So we need to, to be minded of that even within some of the, the campaigns that, as again, Whilst I wholeheartedly believe they're well intended, there's something about actually looking at this from the community perspective in terms of what we actually do to look after each other as well. And last year, well, this year, sorry, we ran a campaign in Wolverhampton that was more around, you know, look after your mates, keep an eye out for somebody, more looking at the community, looking after those who are actually potentially struggling, not the other way around in terms of just you know, asking people who are already struggling to seek help and, and support. Because many people tell us, many survivors tell us, I've reached out for help and the help hasn't been particularly helpful. So we need to be minded of that um, as we go in through this when we look at it from a, a critical um, lens. So one of the things that we um, do with our own training strategy here at Wolverhampton, uh, our own university, um, but also, I, I, very much believe it's a common feature of, of, of many face-to-face -face or, or you know, um, human training. And what I mean by that is not a video and then you get to the end and it's, it's, it's done. Is to get us to stop and think. And what I would implore anybody to do when they're actually engaging in this exercise, if you so wish, is whilst you're considering what might stop somebody from talking about their distress, look at this on the macro level of suicide as a topic itself of how difficult it is to talk about suicide and suicidal feelings and feeling that your life isn't worth living. But also at the, 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 the micro level of the individual of what they may navigate to seek help. When you start to add other components to that in terms of other lenses of, of neurodiversity, communication difficulties, when you could go back to this slide here of just talk, well, that might well be easy if you don't depend on British Sign Language as a way of communicating with the world in a world that doesn't commonly use that as a way of actually communicating. So again, I, I'm really, really keen to, to put a call to action really for anyone who's interested in suicide prevention campaigns to think about this from the point of view of who do they actually stand to omit? Who do they actually stand to push out? 
and don't include when they actually send out those particular uh, messages. Some of the things that commonly come through when we talk about this in terms of what might stop people from coming out and talking about their distress and admitting that they're actually struggling is that very often they might not have the words. They might not have the words to articulate just how they're feeling. Many survivors tell us that they've done this before, that they have reached out for support and because the help hasn't been particularly helpful, they've been made to feel like they're in a burden and that they're a problem. That prevents them from coming forward. There's a trauma attached to reaching out for help. Another thing to be minded of also is that very often when we think about how we talk about suicide as a general topic, language is said to matter. And I say it is said to matter because I don't really think I have the right to tell people how to talk about this subject because I don't want people to not talk about it through fear of saying the wrong thing or use the wrong word. But many survivors and those arguably who are bereaved will tell them that language very, do, very, very much does matter. So I don't know whether if you've heard of the automatic connotation of successful suicide attempt. You know, imagine how painful that, that sounds to somebody who's bereaved because there's nothing successful about their loss. It also assumes far too heavily that that's what that person definitely wanted to do. We, we don't know, we don't know. Another thing that we often hear is that people who die by suicide are incredibly selfish. And I understand some of that sense making. And again, I don't have any right to tell people of how to make sense of such a difficult loss. It's, 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 it's a grief with the, the volume yanked up. But I also know it doesn't help those who are left behind much further down the line when they want their loved one to be remembered for much more than what, what their final act was. And I think we very often go down the route of judging people against how we feel about how they have, of, of what they have, you know, in terms of the pain that they've left behind and assume that that was their intention. And we know from many people who have survived that that wasn't their intention at all. Very often people believe they believe they would be better off, you know, the other people around them would be better off without them. And we know that that's not true. So it's, it's incredibly complex but also maybe we've made it too complex and not stripped this back down to the humanity of the situation. Another thing to be minded of and for us to think about is what might stop you from wanting to hear or to listen to the emotional distress of others and not not you know not notwithstanding that it can be difficult but arguably what about your own pain if this triggers difficult feelings for you if it triggers a helplessness in you and many people talk about the fact that they worry if they are somebody who somebody's disclosed to saying the wrong thing, um, not having the right words to say, making matters worse. All of this is coming from a really, really good place of, of not wanting to make matters worse. It's a conversation about how we can potentially support each other in that interaction to keep that person as safe as we possibly can for now. Another thing that we often, you know, another myth and misunderstanding that we, we tend to uncover is that people then feel that they are responsible for that other person's life thereafter and forevermore, because they have been the one that they have disclosed um, suicide or thoughts to. And if they go on to lose their life to suicide, that they will be somehow to, to blame. And that's incredibly complex uh, sense making. But the only way that I can assume responsibility for somebody else's life is to move in with them and stay awake 24 hours a day and watch them. That's the only way that I can achieve that level of bar of responsibility for somebody else's life. Um, it's not reasonable, it's not practicable. I think we need to conceive a way of actually a mitigation approach of what can I do in the next minute? in the next three minutes, in the next five, in the next 10, to make this situation as safe as I possibly can, to offer as much as a support as what I possibly can, to try and listen with the view to understand what that person's going through. And then I think another thing that we need to be minded here of is, is arguably when we look at some of the systems and organizational barriers that we navigate when we're thinking about um, how we might seek help or how we might signpost people uh, for support. 
I think one of the, the, the most nonsense things I've ever seen in, in practice is where somebody says, Here, here's a number, ring this number and ring it for the first time when you're in crisis. It's not easy to do that for, for anyone, let alone somebody who might experience additional communication barriers or, or view themselves differently within that world. So it, this might seem commonplace. This might seem like an easy thing to do, and it's not. So that's a barrier in terms of how we access the inroad to some of these services. Um, so hopefully by the end of this session, we'll, we'll, I can give you some tips of how we might mitigate the risk of, of that. The, the very well, I've signposted, so I've done my bit. How can we make it more likely that that person will feel able to actually come forward and, and admit that that's what's going on for them and get the help that they not only might need, but they deserve. They deserve. I think one of the things I've always been worried about uh, within any suicide prevention strategy or within our community is that we try and avoid through our inclusive lens, this principle of, of this, of, of I've got one of yours here. And you know, my career within uh, nursing, the very acute end of, of the um, spectrum of provision, but also here in higher education, the amount of times I've heard this um, it, it really does, it hurts, it hurts because, well, which one are you actually talking about? Which one are we, we talking about when we think about suicidal thoughts and, and, and individuals who are experiencing such emotional pain? Add to the component of that when we think about this through an inclusive lens around disability. For those who experience um, difficulties in regulating their emotions that feel more amplified, they will view them in a, a more amplified um, way. Those who already have a pre-existing mental health um, condition, those with physical um, disability, those with um, impairment, all, all manner of things we can think about, add the, the, the layers of intersection on top of that that actually will make this automatic response feel more hurtful because they're already othered very often in their everyday life anyway. Um, so we need to be minded of it. But going back to the statistics that I mentioned earlier on, could I tell you accurately how many people with a diagnosis of, say, autism have died by suicide in the UK in the last five years? Not accurately. No, no, no. I, I can't. And there is some really interesting work actually being conducted by um, Cassidy uh, and, and, and colleagues at the... Um, where they engaged in what is called a psychological autopsy approach of where they've gone in and looked at coroner's records of those who have died by suicide within a couple of regions within England, actually. So it's a, it's a, a, a UK based um, study. And their findings are really quite profound. And they would, you know, Cassidy and her colleagues would argue that a significant number of people who died by suicide were likely, likely autistic, but undiagnosed. According to new research that highlights the urgent need for earlier diagnosis and tailored support for suicide prevention. So this is really a call to action for us to start to think about that in terms of not just those who we know have a particular diagnosis um, or those who we know identify in that way. We need to be cognizant of the barriers that people in uh, you know, individuals navigate to even get that diagnosis and that meaning around some of the difficulties that they navigate in their life. I wanted to also share with you um, a, a theoretical perspective on, on, on suicidal um, thinking. Um, and there are many out there, but for me, this is probably one of the most um, explanatory in terms of, of, of and, and accessible in terms of how this might apply to any one of us. But think about this for somebody who already feels that they are potentially don't belong in society. Somebody who already potentially lives through their life believing that they're a burden. We know that thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness are red flags in suicidal thinking, massive red flags. So again, I'd, I'd, I'd implore us to think about this. So this particular interpersonal theory of the, the pathway um, around suicidal uh, behavior is this thwarted belongingness. So an example might there be, I'm, I'm alone. 
And it's been, been worth being a, minded of the fact that for some individuals, when they disclose that they're feeling suicidal, they might not actually use the word. They might say it in other ways. Perceived burdensomeness. So yeah, I'm a burden. You know, people would be better off without me. I'm, 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 I'm a bother to people. And hopelessness. So the perception of the future is that the things aren't going to get any better. So things will never change. This will always be the way it is. That can then lead through, can, not all, it's not inevitable. And that's something we need to challenge here, the inevitability of suicidal thinking through to action. But this is where this path can arguably go of, you know, I, I want to end my life. And when you think about the capability for suicide, that's where arguably is another red flag of, you know, I'm not afraid of that pathway. I'm not afraid that can then arguably lead to suicidal behaviour or near, near suicidal uh, behaviour, i.e. self-harm. Self and for me, this is, you know, it, it's a phenomenal um, framework, very, very simple, but could apply to absolutely anyone. You don't have to have a diagnosis of, of, of a mental illness to experience the, these thoughts. And things can be going quite well in your life when you feel this way. So I think we need to try and remove ourselves away from a, a deficit model of suicidal behavior or thinking of that something's necessarily inherently wrong with someone. No, just lots, lots is happening <laughs> to that person. And some of those things can be good. You know, if I reflect on my own life, some of the most stressful times have been when things are going really well, really, really well. Um, my career, my family life, but how many of us can really stop and, and say that when things are going well, that we don't start to have doubt creep in to think this is going to stop. This can't last forever. So sometimes we don't even trust our own happiness. So that's a, a tip really to, to think about in terms of that people don't have to have lots of, of, of difficult things that they're navigating in their lives but from again it just might be lots of, of things happening it wouldn't be me if i didn't mention um higher education student uh, risk factors because obviously this is a, an area where much of my work um lies but if we think about this again through a disability and inclusion lens we need to, to be reminded of how these are potentially amplified for individuals with um disabilities so we know through research um, that those with early childhood trauma experiences, and I think of, of, of many dear friends who have gone through their childhood being told they're naughty, um, they'll never make anything of themselves um, because they've been misunderstood. They've been misunderstood, and that might be due to uh, uh, an un uh, diagnosed issue around dyslexia, learning difference, you name it, any number of things that have just gone off the radar, but instead we've judged people's behaviour um, in terms of, and, and then decided to label them in another way in terms of being deviant um, or, or naughty and manage them accordingly. And it's one of the things I'm always minded of within mental health services is that very often we, we risk diagnostically overshadowing uh, people, particularly with neurodiversity, as, as, as clumping them into a, another category that actually doesn't quite fit for them, doesn't actually quite make sense. Many people ask me this question in terms of what do they actually mean by parenting style? And this is more so around, and, and I'm guilty of this, I've got two boys of maybe potentially doing too much for them um, and being very protective and not allowing them to potentially develop their own buoyancy and, and problem solving ability. Social media, again, very often we think of social media automatically being a bad thing. Um, it can be incredibly protective for people. It can give people communities, but we can't ignore either the fact that you can access some very damaging, very triggering, very concerning content within literally through three Google clicks. Um, so we need to, to be minded of that. Transitions. Um, and again, this is an area I'm particularly interested in for our disabled students and students who maybe don't experience the typical university course. Um, if we think about placement learning, if we think about students who start midway through the year, international students, add then disability and, and, and difference in terms of how you might make sense of them, then we need to be minded that that is potentially a red flag, but one that we need to address at its source, not just look at our students as the source of the problem. 
and they have to deal with it. And one of the things I'd really like to challenge is the inevitability of the stressfulness of, of higher education. Oh, well, it's just stressful. It's the way it is. Well, does it have to be? Does everything about higher education have to be stressful? Can we, God forbid, not enjoy the experience that actually we have as, as students? This is a really interesting one. And I think this is something that I think how many times I've heard it where, again, colleagues might say this is a good student this is a good student and when I asked them to you know what, what do we actually mean by that or what does a bad student look like it was probably me by the way <laughs> when I was a student but ultimately this perfectionism we know we have individuals who do incredibly well incredibly well academically so you look at their transcript and they are submitting on time, they're attending everything, they are hitting firsts. We can't allow ourselves to be distracted by the fact that that person still might not be paddling frantically. Paddling frantically. So I think we need to be minded here of that it isn't just about those who are, are struggling academically, it's those who might be doing very well who still might be struggling nonetheless. And this socially prescribed perfectionism is something I think we needed, need to be um, minded of. And then also suicide suggestion, i.e. clusters and how we report on, on suicide um, deaths is, is incredibly important. Another thing in terms of that I would like to, to potentially problematize is this, this notion um, of, of risk around suicide, you know, that arguably, you know, you are high risk or you are low risk. If we were to revisit the statistics, I can arguably say that the majority of people who die by suicide in the UK aren't known to mental health services at the time of their death. Now, I don't necessarily make an assertion that they should have been, nor can I tell you how many people were trying to access those services. I don't know. I don't know. I just want to put, put that there really in terms of how many might have been potentially trying to access those services. But it does make a case for this democratised approach that I'm talking about, that arguably every one of us will come into contact with someone. Um, and some of the work we've done in Wolverhampton, we've supported um, barbers and hairdressers in the city. And you might think, well, why? Well, I have, you know, I have had my hairdresser for the last 20 years, the same person in my life who I go and sit there for at least three hours. It's going to get longer as I'm getting older. Um, and who we, we talk, we, we interact. She's been there through many, many signposts in my life, difficult ones, happy ones. And many of them have told us that people will come into our, our, our presence and disclose difficult situations and we want to feel more equipped to help them so as I say there is an example of where I don't believe you have to be an expert in whatever that looks like to make a difference I really really don't I think another thing I'm really minded of if we think about this from a high and low risk threshold if we only ever say to the individuals who meet a high risk threshold that that is the only way you are going to get help what are we kind of forcing people to perform to the narrative of? Just to be heard. Just to be heard. And I would argue that, as I say, if we can go down this approach of a more inclusive environment where we just take every expression of someone's suicidal thinking or feelings of hopelessness that can start with no intention to die, but a feeling of, if I didn't wake up tomorrow, it wouldn't be a big deal. I'm just so tired. I'm so sad. I'm just so fed up of everything that's going on. Take that seriously. Don't need to panic, but just listen with a view to understand. And then we're not forcing people to perform to higher risk narrative or to get there just to be heard. So there is heightened risk, of course there is, but there is also unknown. Because I would also argue that there, you know, there isn't a single person on this planet who knows everything about me. There are some things I do have a right to keep to myself. So when we're thinking about an inclusive environment in which we can potentially save lives, we need to be minded that we need to earn the right to ask the questions and look people in the eye. Ask for permission to help also. May I make a suggestion as opposed to going in there thinking you have to have any. 
So there's all manner of things we can think about of how we might strip this back and deconstruct it, but arguably take every expression seriously, meet it with empathy and understanding on every single occasion. Even if this happens to be the hundredth time you've heard it from that person, because that's another thing that can make us believe, and that's another myth and misunderstanding that we hear. Um, oh, well, if they really wanted to do it, they'd have done it by now anyway. The majority of people who do lose their life by suicide have tried before. So we need to remember that. We do need to remember that. And I'm, I'm not sure it's helpful to start creating a, a space of where we disbelieve people um, because arguably it's, it, it blocks them out. It blocks them out. So I, anyone um, who knows me um, in this session would argue that we try and aim for a, a more, to instill a more compassionate um, community um, uh, in terms of our response to, to those who might be in distress. And very often when we start to think about well, what does actually compassion mean, it's what part of the programme that we run here in the university in collaboration with For Mental Health. And compassion isn't an a, 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 a iterative process. It's actually a really difficult thing to do. It's a very, very difficult thing to, to, to be on every single occasion. So I think it's, it's minded here that when we talk about compassion to others, actually where it does need to start is with self. And that's even more difficult. I'm not sure anybody on this planet would ever judge me as harshly as I judge myself. I'm not sure some of the narrative I've spoken into my own life about my own self, would I dare speak to anyone else? I wouldn't, even somebody I didn't like particularly much, I wouldn't speak it into their life. So when I'm talking about the next steps in terms of compassion, it isn't selfish, this is about being sustainable and looking to actually develop a better relationship with ourselves. And I think it has the potential to really contribute towards suicide prevention. The first tenet of compassion for me, for us to take away is to conceive that we are probably more alike than we are unalike as a species. And I'm talking about this at a very metaphysical level in terms of how our brains fundamentally work, you know, in terms of the relationship between our, our human brain and our animal brain and how that drives very metaphysical uh, reactions to stress. We're pretty much the same in, in that sense. But then again, what makes us who we are won't ever be repeated, ever. We are set to never be repeated again. And I'm not sure we hone in on that enough in terms of the individuality of people or any of us for that matter, but even those, as I say, arguably, when we think about this through a disability and inclusion lens, a diagnosis doesn't have to define someone. It's a feature of, 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 of their, 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 their identity, but it's not it. Not everything that somebody does thereafter is as a result of that particular um, diagnosis, whatever that may arguably be. And that's why for some individuals, diagnosis can be incredibly empowering. It can give them access to the support that they both need and deserve. But for other individuals who've received any number of diagnoses, they would argue that they don't want it to saturate their very existence and that then just be all that they are known for. Um, it's that they want to be seen as a set of, of strengths, not as a set of problems to be fixed. So that's one of the things that I would really do in terms of a, a call to action, in fairness, in terms of, of, of viewing ourselves and indeed others as a set of needs, of course, we all have needs, but also strengths. Every one of us has a story that is set to never be repeated again. Every one of us potentially exists on a continuum at some point that we arguably all have a breaking point. Put enough pressure on a human being without enough support, without enough respite, without enough, of, enough hope, any one of us may experience hopelessness, worthlessness, and feel that we are not worthy of, of, of living. And again, I think we need to actually strip it back to that particular principle that this doesn't just happen to other people, this one in four, it could happen to any one of us. As the helper, as somebody who is actually in a helping situation, I think it's really important to actually manage these principles between empathetic concern, but also then how that might tip into empathetic distress. 
And it's one of the reasons why I'm possibly so anti uh, a mental health champion or a mental health first aider model within workplaces where one person is the person that people die, you know, signpost people to. That there's any number of problems with that because I think very rarely do those roles get supported with time, pay, and also super, you know, supervision, i.e. space for that person to offload and make sense of some of the things that they've been hearing. And rarely are those individuals, it's not about training, it's about that they've got other features of their particular job. I think a much more sustainable way forward is to give everybody the opportunity to consider their role in the event you get that disclosure, because I still can't mitigate the risk of if Julian's our mental health champion, that somebody might opt to go to somebody else within that particular team, because we are human beings. Sometimes disclosure is opportunistic. It's the moment's there, the moment's ripe. And that's what happens every single day and does save lives. So going back to this principle of, of compassion, really, this isn't just about empathy and understanding. And for me, empathy isn't about me putting myself in someone else's shoes, because I don't think that's fair. Or, or I, I just don't. That, that's my personal view. For me, empathy is just the ability to believe someone's story as they tell it. And if they are discussing things that are making them feel overwhelmed, that I try with all my might not to judge it against my bar. Because it's going to go one way or the other, isn't it? I'm going to think, oh my goodness, how would I cope in that situation? Or I might go down the other route of thinking, well, I've dealt with things like that before and it's no big deal. Just believe somebody, believe their story as they tell it and what's driving their distress for them. And I think that for me is the underpinning principle of, of empathy, not putting myself in their shoes per se. I think another thing we need to be minded of when we think about a compassionate response is to recognize that human beings can be incredibly tribal and tribalism in, in, in our humanity can um, be to its benefit, but it can also be the curse. You know, we, we're very, very good at potentially offering support and connection to individuals who we might be able to actually instantly connect with, who might look similar, who we might share a similar story with. It's much diff more difficult to, to do that with individuals who aren't automatically similar. And I think that actually the world needs more of the latter, not more of the, the other. The ability to treat somebody who you actually fundamentally view as different in exactly the same way as somebody who you feel an automatic connection with. And it's a difficult thing, thing to do. But I think we really need to have to dig deep and, and, and try that if we, if we possibly uh, can. I'm very um, aware of the time, so I'll probably um, skip through this particular slide quite quickly, but I've kind of covered those particular attributes of, of compassion as presented by um, Professor Paul Gilbert. Um, and as I say, hopefully we can recognise here that it isn't an easy thing to do, but how, how would we potentially apply this to ourselves? Um, you know, sensitivity to our own distress. The motivation to actually help ourselves and, and seek the help that we need and to not judge ourselves too harshly. Um, I think, you know, we, we're all potentially guilty of that at some point in, in our life. And it's really this that underpins, again, much of the, the philosophy of looking at this whole community system of, of, of support within suicide prevention in terms of recognising that actually human beings when we've got a problem, I think we're so much better when we get our heads together with a view to help each other. I think we're capable of phenomenal things. Um, and I, I think we, we are designed to bond and connect in, in some form or, or another. But if we can just think about this one simple rule of how might we want to be treated in this situation? How about actually how you would want your loved one to be treated in this situation? Again, another thing that Gilbert's theory of compassion would argue is that human beings have an incredible kin bias. Um, and it's what's contributed towards our survival, how dependent we are on our kin in particular in terms of, 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 of nurturing us and bringing us up. So I always try and view it that, you know, anyone who I come into contact with who might need help, they aren't my someone, but they are someone's someone. They're someone's everything. 
Um, and, and, you know, I really do believe that a compassionate response has the ability to save lives. It can save time. It's the amount of time you might be there scrambling around thinking, who do I pass this person on to in the immediate sense? Might just well be better spent with that person to actually figure out a strategy of how you might keep them safe for now and does arguably improve outcomes. I wanna finish off this session today talking about another problem that I think we have particularly within research around um, suicide prevention and around inclusivity and the fact that rarely do you ever see survivor voice. So if we look at the research design of, of many of the studies um, that are out there, researchers who are uh, experts in, in the field have got a passion for it. You know, they, they've already kind of preconceived the design, haven't they? They've already preconceived the, what they want to find out. And I'm really, really interested more and more over the years of how we actually co-produce that understanding together of what we want to arguably uh, find out to be more inclusive. So some of the work we've actually um, collaborated with is, is Dr. Monica Ferguson there, who stood next to me in this picture from the University of South Australia, who's worked with um, indigenous communities um, to look at, at suicide prevention principles. And the gentleman who stood next to Monica is, is a dear friend of mine, um, Steve Gilbert, who I'm actually going to leave the final words to um, in a moment. And I'll tell you about Steve's um, story. And then again, for any of you who've been into city campus and have, have seen the wolf um, that is proudly there, he, he, he does mean an incredible lot to, to me and many others, because this was very much co-conceived and designed with those who have survived suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts, those who've experienced poor, poor um, uh, mental and emotional health. And this wolf was designed with the view to actually conceive what suicide prevention means to them. And for me, when you look at the jigsaw design, they argue that that represents the, the importance of connection, the five a day for well-being. Just, just have a look if you have the opportunity and haven't so far. Um, and it's, it's called the Supporting uh, Life uh, Wolf. Another example of, of co-production is something that was done uh, a few years ago, uh, a campaign called Dear Distressed. And it was aligned to this principle of, of compassion to self. Uh, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. And um, Dr. Alice Colking and others worked with survivors to actually write and publish a compassionate letter to self in the event that you might need it in the future, i.e. when you are feeling overwhelmed, suicidal, or, or that your life arguably isn't worth living. Steve is, is, a, is a dear friend of mine, as, as noted, who started to experience mental health difficulties just as he went into to university as a, as a, as a young lad. Um, he's had interaction with the police. He's been sectioned under the Mental Health Act. Um, he's experienced racism um, in, in the services. He's, he's experienced all manner of things uh, through his journey. And Steve now, um, is, is not just a living experience expert, he is the go-to um, when we think about the reforms that we need within mental health um, services. So he's worked with government um, on, on mental health at review. Um, he's done some phenomenal um, things and he's very supportive of our university. And this is part of, of Steve's letter. I'm not gonna read, read all of it, but this is part of Steve's letter to himself that's published online. So it's obviously with permission. And if ever you want to know how to understand potentially somebody who's feeling this way or what to say to them, I think this is where I go to my expertise, not necessarily a, a researcher's view or interpretation of it. So you would argue, dear Steve, I know that you're feeling all alone and that you are scared. You probably haven't slept properly in weeks and you're exhausted. I know that you believe that we are better off without you and that dying is probably the best for everyone. I know that you want out of the crushing pain you feel, but I also know that you want to actually see it another way. I also know that you want to live, but you can't live the way things are. I know that you have a bright future ahead of you and a life full of love, enjoyment and fulfillment. I know that you want somebody to ask you, how are you? And for them to truly mean it. And I know that you want someone to listen to you and to take you seriously. This could save your life. I know that you feel it's weak to talk about your feelings, but talking about them is actually the strongest thing that you can do. 
I know that people telling you cheer up mate, things will get better, whilst well-meaning does little to help. And I know that being told what have you got to be depressed about feels like a blow to the head. I know that there is a reason why you feel the way that you do. And I know the traumatic experiences of your childhood cause you real damage to your mental health. I know you have a diagnosable mental health problem that, that, that can be treated and can be managed. And I know that there will be many challenges for you and your mental health, but things can and will get easier. I know that you will get the correct medical care and a team that will help you to understand your thoughts and the feelings and live life to the full. I unfortunately know that this will not be the last time you experience suicidal thoughts, but also that you will build a network of friends, family and people you haven't met yet, who will be there to support you through your darkest days. I need you to know that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary situation and I need you to know that the suicidal voice in your head is simply a sign that you are unwell and that you need more support and care in your life. Just hold on, fight with everything you have to stay here. You are a brilliant individual. You deserve to live, love, laugh from one friend to another. I don't know how I've actually got through that, um, to, to be frank, but he's, he's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and if you have a look at that resource, there are plenty of other letters, compassionate letters to self. How difficult would it have been for Steve to actually write that? But for me, that just tells me everything I need to know in terms of how we might keep ourselves safe and how people are feeling when they are going through those particular um, thoughts. Another thing I'm really passionate about, as is Steve and, and other colleagues who um, I've had the privilege of working with, is the principle of safety planning. And safety planning for all, even if you can hand on heart say that you've never experienced a suicidal thought in your life, I think it's, it's still prudent to have a safety plan, just in case. A safety plan that is underpinned with the absolute belief that things can and will get better and that you matter. You might not always get it right, you might not always float everyone's boat, um, but you are unique and you have a right to be here. So safety planning is something that actually, it, it sets out a, a list of strategies that are very, very individual to you. And I think they're always better to try and do these with somebody who you trust, so you're not doing them on your own where you can co-agree some of the things that you might do to actually get through situations right now, things that might help you to make your situation safer, things to lift or calm your mood. And you can see here that whilst they're very broad, these are gonna be very nuanced and individual to you. So I can give you an example that things to make my situation safer are to not be on my own. Um, I would make a point of actually being with somebody and trying to distract myself. I also love music, um, so I have a, a playlist. Uh, there's things that do automatically lift or calm my mood. Certain films, my go-to films, that I know I can just escape and work things through. I also know that I'm an infernal worrier and that when I've got lots of things going on, um, I need to try and organize those worries and come up with a strategy of how I might actually solve what's on my mind. But this also lists and goes down right to the point of what you might do to actually reach out for support from formal services. We cannot keep expecting people to ring the crisis team, ring Samaritans, ring any of these numbers for the first time when they're already feeling overwhelmed. It's setting them up to inevitably not be able to do that easily. So one of the most practical ways of actually making someone's situation safe for all your own is to practice ringing these services, play it out with somebody, role play it or ring them. They don't mind you doing that to just say, I just want to see what I'd expect if I were to ring you, if I'm feeling overwhelmed. If we have communication difficulties, it might be worth actually pre-researching what is available for me if I'm hard of hearing um, and you know, what else is available that I can actually access as opposed to a talking service. This for me, as I say, is the most inclusive practice going forward around safety planning because it's for everyone, but arguably it can be nuanced to that individual and their needs and their strengths. Hopefully um, there is a, a link that's appeared in the chat so far. Um, 
www.stayingsafe.net um, and that is a resource where you can download a blank safety plan where you can watch some videos to actually um, make sense of how you might go about safety planning um, and this is one thing that we can actually introduce people to if we don't know what else to say in terms of you know have you heard about safety planning have you ever made your own safety plan Similarly, for individuals who've experienced suicidal thoughts quite often or live with them often, they have a 100% survival rate. That's how we need to view individuals as incredible, incredibly strong individuals. This is just about strategizing some of those things and actually writing them down. So I just want to say thank you uh, for having me today and for Melanie and for Julian and the colleagues to actually invite me uh, along. I hope it's been okay. I hope it hasn't upset any of you um, in, in, a, in a way that's distressing. I hope it's given you some hope. Um, the fact that we can be part of the history of suicide prevention. We are part of it now um, and, and we can change it. It's, it's a delicate contingent history that we can be part of actually changing as we go forward. And sessions such as today, um, you know, when you get home, they might be on your mind or you might still be making sense of them. So do me a favour and do something nice for yourself. Um, it doesn't matter if it's too indulgent. Just do something nice for yourself and look after yourself. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire, for such a fantastic presentation. It was more than OK. It was great. Um, I've actually just, just been a message in the chat from Poonam Sangre. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly to say they've signed up to the next webinar, but haven't received the Zoom link. Um, if that's the webinar for today, I've just put it in the chat, so you should be able to access it there. Paula Howison saying many thanks, Claire, that was brilliant. And I note that you're also taking part in the learning and teaching conference um, in a couple you. of weeks time. So more opportunities to see Claire there as well. Uh, those for, in the Faculty of Education, Health and Wellbeing. Um, I wanted to ask um, a question. You spoke about, sometimes there are no words to articulate how you're feeling. Um, and then sometimes kind of verbally communicate can be so challenging. Are there any kind of tips or techniques that you've learned to use different methods of communication in those circumstances? I'm thinking, you know, from the perspective as a mother with two young children, you know, if I want to try and get them to understand things, sometimes I have to act out with toys and that sort of thing. You know, have you learned strategies that work either for children or adults that are different to verbal communication? that might also work well with people who have different types of disabilities? I think for me, if, if we strip it back to how people in general might communicate their distress, and that there's been a big push lately, hasn't there, around men's mental health. And I hate the assertion that all oh, men don't talk about their feelings or men don't communicate their feelings. And I, I don't think that's strictly true. Um, I live uh, in a household full of them. I'm the only girl other than one dog. <laughs> and the, the, you know, if I look at this from my husband's point of view, who if he was to start coming in from work and, and automatically going for a, a, a drink, an alcoholic drink, that isn't him. That isn't that. That's unusual. That communicates something to me, doesn't it, in terms of how that person might well uh, be, be feeling in that point. And I think similarly with with children. I mean, I didn't mention the statistic, but, you know, children as young as five can experience suicidal thoughts and people, it's just incomprehensible. But when we talk to many adult survivors, they say they can remember being very young children and thinking, I just want the world to stop. I want to get off it. I want to disappear. So we look at that then maybe where children are engaging in behaviours that we might automatically construe as naughty um, or risk, very risky, you know, running out into dangerous situations. Um, I think for me, the, the biggest, I don't even want to call it a skill, gift that you can give somebody is to just be with them and tolerate their distress, um, however that might well manifest, um, and to just sit with that. It can be uncomfortable, but to just sit with that, I think, is very often, that person is still safe, aren't they? They are there in front of you. You are tolerating their, their distress. Um, if we think about it when people are crying, one of the first things we do is reach for a tissue, pat on the back, and what we kind of want them to do is stop, <laughs> just to stop crying. Cr crying is a very good affiliative system to actually get, get out. And many of us feel better after we've had a good cry. So if you can tolerate that and just be with somebody, I think that whoever they are, whatever age, I think, yeah, 
yeah i mean there is also a resource that i would advise for any parent who's got children who've got um devices at home is the ripple tool um uh, and, and i can certainly send the link if you want to send that out to delegates uh, melanie that Alice Hendy um, uh, designed or the, the conceived the idea after her brother lost his life um, to suicide in 2020. And when she looked at Josh's phone and looked at his laptop, some of the things he was actually accessing were really quite disturbing. And they were there within two clicks. Now, Josh had Tourette's, he had a terrible stammer, chronic social anxiety. So the idea of when you go onto Google and it says ring the Samaritans, it wouldn't help Josh, it wouldn't. So this, this tool is designed to actually intervene. It doesn't spike, it doesn't collect your data. It's not gonna have a big drone come over your head. It doesn't collect any of the analytics. It's just there to offer a gentle nudge to take you to sources of support, not sources that are gonna make things more dangerous. And I think particularly with children, we need to be very minded that, it, that they can get on some very, very challenging um, interfaces on, on the web very, very easily, where they're not only seeing means of dying by suicide, but there are people actively encouraging them. Yeah. Yeah, it's frightening to think the, the access that they have on the web, um, I have to say. Thank you, Claire, so much for giving up your time today to share your thoughts. People saying in the chat, thank you, Claire, that was brilliant. Thank you for your presentation. Oh. So. Uh, I'm conscious I'm going to need to go into the next session, um, but if anyone has got any questions that have come up, um, Claire, is it possible for you to share in the chat your um, email details just so that people can reach out to you directly if there's something they want to follow up with? And as I said, um, Claire will be talking at the Learning and Teaching Conference for few as well in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I've put in the chat the access to the next session, which is looking at accessibility in the arts. So um, feel free to join us there if you would like to. Otherwise, thank you very much, everybody, for your attendance today and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, Claire. Take good care, everyone. Have a lovely, lovely week. And you.